and we'll just do the order that's, that it's in your lab manual. Okay, so the general term for worms is helmets. And again, we're going to break them down into three big categories. And, and for the lab practical guys, I would like you to know which category a particular parasitic worm belongs to. So we'll follow your lab manual. It talks about cestodes. And these are the so-called tapeworms. And they're called tapeworms because they grow in these segments called proglottids. And the proglottids are basically just egg-making machines, is what they are. And the um, two examples of tapeworms we're going to have you guys take a look at. One of them you're, you're already familiar with, um, Tania solium. Tania solium is the pork tapeworm. And we'll come back and discuss how um, we get inspected with this one. And a related species is Tania saginata. It's the so-called bee tapeworm. Okay, so I'll just set the stage here and then we'll come back and discuss um, life cycles. Okay, so we'll come back to cestodes. The second group that we'll discuss today are the trematodes. Make sure, yeah. The trematodes. And these are the so-called flukes. And it's called schist schistosoma. 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 Okay, and, and again, we'll come back and describe life cycle there. Now, there's another third group, the nematodes, and this is the group that we have the greatest variety of samples. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave nematodes until Thursday because there's I think we have like three or four different examples of nematodes and the um, life cycles are, are relatively diverse. So we'll just tackle these first two groups, okay? And again, it's nice, the cestodes, you all already are familiar with uh, Tania solium, the pork tapeworm. And um, again, we want to do life cycles. And here, we're so lucky that Professor Meyer downloaded all these um, life cycles. So um, for the Tania, the Tania solium life cycle, let's take a look here. We've got nematodes, the first three life cycles. Right, so it's on page for you guys that the, the pork tape form life cycle is shown. Okay, so let's just take a look there. Um, so let me, let me do it over here. And again, we'll just do just kind of the highlights of it. Okay, so what happens is, you know, as this is a pig, this is a pig. So the, pro the problem is um, pigs can be infected with the, the tapeworms in their intestines. Okay, pigs, so they're infected with the uh, um, adult tapeworm, the tenia solium in the intestine. They have a, a head with suckers and a hook. So I'm just trying to draw the head here. Okay, so it has a head called the scolex, which has suckers and hooks that it uses to attach to the inside of the intestinal wall. So it doesn't get pooped out. And then from the scolex, um, it starts growing these little segments or proglottids. The further away from the head, the older the proglottid is, and these proglottids, they're just basically egg-producing little factories. They're full of eggs. Yeah. And so when the proglottids reach the end, they're mature, they break off. So here's a proglottid, and it's chock full of eggs. And where, where are the proglottids with their eggs? How, how are they going to leave the pig? And pig poo, right? So that the proglottids chock full of the tapeworm eggs are going to be excreted in feces, right? Okay, so we're going to have oops, the proglottids.
wattage and the eggs and the feces. So here again, we have this huge concern. Wherever feces goes, the worm eggs go, right? So mm -hmm. it contaminates drinking water, it contaminates food. So what can happen is that maybe the farmer, you know, that's um, taking care of the pigs. If you guys have ever farmed, you know, it's hard work. A lot of times you're covered in manure, right? And there might not always be warm, warm water and soap for you to wash up. Pretty easy for farmers to have some fecal oral, you know, mm -hmm. transmission. Nice. So what happens is wherever the feces goes with the eggs, okay, so we'll put fecal contaminated food or water. The huge concern is, is that if humans, water, if humans ingest the eggs, what happens is the eggs will pass through the stomach into the intestine and they hatch. And they hatch into little baby worms called larvae. So we'll call them larval worms. And the larval worms, what they do is they burrow out of the intestine and they can spread throughout the body. And so the, the worms, they, they spread throughout the body. And then they form these little resting stages that you guys saw. They form this resting stage called cystocercus. Um, the cystocercus, it can form in skeletal muscle, so we have these little cystocerci in our muscles, right? Um, but they can really form anywhere, in our diaphragm. Um, one of the really scary things, you guys, is they can form in the brain. Yeah. yeah. And they're, oh my gosh, some of the pathology uh, samples, if you do a cystocercus human brain image search, um, there have been folks that on autopsy, they've done thin sections through their brains, and they, their brains look like Swiss cheese, but the holes are all these little cystocerci. So if you, know, if you have a patient that's demonstrating neurological signs, it's, it is something you should think about. They could have cystocercosis. This, this condition is called cystocercosis. So these little cystocerci can cause lots of tissue damage. Um, if the little cystocerci die, you'll get a, an inflammatory response, and basically your body just can't clean it up. It's such a you know it's such a big multicellular parasite, so you can get a lot of damage, a lot of tissue damage. So that's one way people can get infected is through uh, fecal contamination of. Um, food or drinking water. Now the other way, which I think is the way your handout cartooned it, is if we eat pork that hasn't been cooked properly, because those little cystocerci, in fact that this way of transmission is what's cartooned on your handout, those little cystocerci can also form in the pigs. If the pigs have become infected by eating um, fecal contaminated food or water, we can also have Cystocerci, cystocerci, just plural, in the pig muscle. And after we butcher a pig, pig muscle is what we call pork, right? So if we swap, if we eat pork that hasn't been properly cooked, you know, that's why when I was growing up, my mom taught me you never eat rare pork. Never, ever, ever. You know, you always cook it really well because of all the parasites. If, if humans eat pork that hasn't been cook well enough, the cystocerci survive, we swallow the cystocerci, the cystocerci emerge in our intestinal tract, and then they develop into the egg-producing tapeworms in our intestine. Okay, so we can also act as a source of eggs, right? If we eat the cystocerci in pork, the cystocerci develop into the egg-producing adults in our intestines, so we too can act as a source of eggs. Yeah? So, so they go back to, or not go back, but into the large stage when they're eating eggs? No, this would be the adult stage here. It's a really confusing life cycle because we can get infected two ways, right? Um, to me, this, okay, to me the more serious way of getting infected is for us to swallow the eggs because it's 
it's, it's in us storing the eggs that will get the cystocerakite form throughout our body. I mean, I could argue, I don't care if the adult tapeworm is in my intestine. I maybe will lose a little bit of weight, you know? But the problem is, if I have an adult teniosolium in my intestine, that means I'm pooping out eggs. I'm pooping out eggs, so then I become a source of eggs for my family. And also, you can do some auto-inoculation, right? I know that sounds gross, right? But in, you could get auto-inoculation, or especially with a little child that doesn't have good bathroom habits. They give people contamination of their fingers and auto inoculate or stick their fingers in your mouth. You know, little kids love to stick their fingers in your mouth. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, I know it's so, it, it's so complicated, isn't it? So, figure the larval stage. It goes, let me see if I can help you get And these, these parasites here. So, figure the basic stage is we'll go egg and it hatches. And it gives rise to a larva. Mm -hmm. This is like simplified worm cycle. And then eventually the larva will uh, mature into an adult. And the adult is going to be the age layer. Mm -hmm. And this is just a generic worm. Okay. So with um, Tania solium, the stage that's going to cause damage to us is what stage? I mean, the most severe damage, like making our brains look like Swiss cheese, it's the lar egg and larva. Yeah, and you're right. It, it would have been by ingesting the egg, but the egg's not going to hurt us. What's going to hurt us the is larva. the larva that hatches from the egg, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is tough. These tapeworms are tough. Yeah. You guys all right with that? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. The other one, and we don't spend a lot of time on this one because I've been trying to get a handle on this, I think this is the one that's most likely to cause the damage from the um, cystocerecosis, cystocerecosis, the little larval worms. And the little bit of reading I've done, it seems like the beef tapeworm, cystocerecosis is not a big deal with, beef, with beef tapeworms. I mean, we still want, wouldn't want to go around, you know, getting ourselves infected with them. But it seems like the taniosolin, the pork tapeworm, is the one that has the most press on damage caused by cystocercosis. Okay, so taniosolinata, beef tapeworm. On the lab practical, we probably focus on taniosolin, the pork tapeworm. This might el also help us under um, understand why many cultures, many religions forbid the consumption of pork. A lot of historians think it could, it could have had to do with public health. Right, because we're going to see another worm, trichinella, trichinosis, is also associated with pork. Yeah, so it might be like some historians say some of these religious cultural taboos may have had really public health connections. Yeah. Okay. Now, you guys, what we're going to do, the last one, the last one here is the, um, that we'll do today is one of the so called flukes or trematodes. And um, we said the tape forms, the cestos look like, uh, uh, um, it looks like a little tape measure in these little segments. <coughs> the flukes tend to be flattened, almost kind of like, a, more like a leaf, all right? And this just a, it's just a soma. We are so fortunate, you guys. We don't have the intermediate hosts for schistosoma here in the United States because this is a devastating parasitic disease. And even though we don't have it here in the United States, worldwide it causes incredible disease, lots of damage. And those of you going into medicine, you need to be aware you're going to be treating people from all over the world, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to be aware that of this parasitic disease um, called schistosomiasis. Now, this life cycle, you guys, is so complicated. It's fascinating. It's fascinating, but it's very complicated. So I want you all to know that on the lab practical, the two stages I want you to identify are the adult worms and the eggs. We're going to talk about intermediate stages, but on the lab practical, questions on the intermediate stages would be bonus questions. And it's just, I recognize you guys are just overwhelmed. So um, let's take a look at the life cycle of uh, schistosoma. And we're going to focus on a, 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 a species called schistosoma mansoni. And let me give you a reference in the handout from Professor Meyer. 
Okay, so if we take a look at page, page five. Now, one reason this cartoon is confusing, it's a generic cartoon showing the, um, the life cycle of many different trematodes. So what might help you guys, um, if, you, if you put an X through the life cycle showing the fish, and you put an X through the life cycle um, um, where it shows like these little plants, put an X there, we're going to follow that innermost life cycle. Okay, the innermost life cycle. So that in the past that caused some confusion. Okay, so let's start with just so a um, example of a blood flu. They live in blood vessels. The adults live in blood vessels. And these guys are wild um, because in contrast to the cestode, there's distinct male and female worms. Okay, so the male and female worms, they mate. And in your slide boxes, you're actually going to see male and female um, worms in the process of um, uh, fertilization of the eggs. It's, it's kind of cool. Of course, you know, nerdy biologists. The males, they envelop they kind of wrap their bodies around the female. So it's almost like if the female is held in this tender embrace. Oh, cool. Biologists, we have no social life, you guys. So, that's not <laughs> so they, they mate, and um, then the female lays these cool spiked eggs. And um, we found a good fecal smear with a nice schistosoma mansoni. Egg, and we've got it in the back on a demo demo scope. And I love these eggs because they're one of the few eggs I know of that have spikes on them, kind of like glass eggs or something. Okay, they got these cool little spikes. Now, what's supposed to happen? What's supposed to happen is that the eggs are supposed to work their way through the intestinal wall. Eggs should, we'll say, and they don't always should, penetrate the blood vessel wall. And these blood vessels are um, associated with the intestinal tract. Okay, so the eggs should penetrate blood vessel walls and penetrate the intestinal wall. Eggs should penetrate blood vessel wall and the intestinal wall so they can be um, excreted in feces, in feces. So will be excreted in feces. Now that's what's supposed to happen. The problem is, a lot of the eggs never make it. And what happens instead is when the adults lay the eggs, the, bloods, the bloodstream um, carries them to different parts of the body. And one of the first places they hit is the liver. Okay, but um, many eggs are spread throughout the body. And one of the big places they end up is in the liver. Okay. And what happens, the eggs can't develop in the liver, eventually they break down, they cause this granulomatous inflammatory response, and again, they're going to cause all kinds of tissue damage. So, and people that have been infected for long periods of time and get infected over and over again, you can have cirrhosis of the liver, you know, they, it, which can end up in liver failure. So, you know, this can kill you, right? So that's one of the big problems there. Okay. And in Professor Holland's pictures here on the last page, you see these poor little boys. And on, um, I, and I'm sure you guys, Professor Holland, wouldn't mind if you downloaded and printed her colored copies of these. They're in her lab, man, lab module on D2L. They're, they're just gorgeous pictures. These two little boys are suffering from schistosomiasis, which one of the names is Bill Hartzia. And they, they have huge inflamed livers. Um, and abdominal distension. And again, remember, that's liver damage going on. And these little kids, these little, little children. Okay, so that's why we're concerned. That's where all the damage comes, is from these eggs that get distributed throughout the body. They break down. They cause this very tissue-destroying granulogenous reaction. But what, you know, so how is this thing perpetuated? So as you'll see in your handout there, what happens is that the eggs, the eggs end up in the feces, you know, that some of the eggs end up in the feces. And this is where the wild, the life cycle gets wild, okay, because we're going to go through several stages here. Now, it's important that the eggs are 
the eggs with the feces are deposited in fresh water. Okay, so fresh water is important. The eggs are going to hatch. And they release a stage called the muricidium. And I'll put a star by it, indicating this would be a bonus question on the, on the lab practical. Okay. So the eggs hatch, and they release a little form called the muricidium. And the myricidium infects a freshwater snail. And this is why we're so lucky, you guys. We do not have the correct kind of freshwater snails here in the United States for schistosoma mansonite. That's why we, luckily, I keep our fingers crossed, will never become endemic. You have to have just the right types of freshwater snails, and we don't have them. So the myricidium in invades the freshwater snail. And in the freshwater snail, it develops into the second stage called the cercaria. And the cercaria, they're, they're really cool, kind of, kind of spooky looking, like right out of a science fiction movie. They have um, a little head that has the genetic information and this tail. And so they're swimming through the water. So if you're in the water, maybe you're, you know, maybe you're swimming, Okay, so here's the water. You know, maybe you're swimming, or maybe you're washing your dishes, or maybe you're uh, doing washing laundry, right? The cercaria, they burrow into your skin. And what they do is only the head enters, and they drop their tails. That's why on a lot of our slides, we see the head and the tails are separated. It's just designed so the tails fall off. Okay, so we get infected uh, by being in water, fresh water, that has the cercaria in it. Okay, so, um, and then once the cercaria get into the bloodstream, they migrate to the blood vessels in the intestinal wall where they develop into adults. And again, they're distinct male and female sexes, and the cycle starts all over again. Okay, so why this is so important, you guys, is um, as we said, we don't have it here in the United States, but different parts of the world have different types of schistosomes. So this is only one of three pretty important species. So if you're doing international travel, it is really important you know if schistosomiasis is going to be endemic to the regions that you visit because you want to be careful um, swimming in lakes or streams where um, it's known that the schistosomes are present. So um, what you, they have tests. They can, they can test you. Like if you do go traveling and you think, that, oh gosh, maybe I was exposed, I went swimming in that lake, and people told me I probably shouldn't. You can be tested when you get home, but having that level of awareness that you know, may have been exposed is gonna be important, yeah. Okay, so again, worldwide, this causes lots and lots of serious disease, and again, for those of you that are gonna be going into medicine, it's important that, that you'll know your patients are gonna come from all different parts of the world, and um, your patients are going to be traveling all over the world. So even though it's not endemic in California, we need to be aware of it. Okay. So the things you would need to know for the schistosome, um, we want you to be able to identify the spiked egg. And again, we've got a great fecal smear in the back. And the other one we'd like you to identify is the male and female um, slide in your micro A box, I think. Let's see. I think about it. Let's see here. It's slide 10 to 17, and that's, I'm pretty sure that's in the micro A box, but let me just give you guys that some of the slides aren't that great. So, um, 10 to 17, okay. Yeah, so slides 10 to 17 are the schistosomes, but again, a lot of the eggs, which are listed here as ova, a lot of the fecal smears aren't that great. So look at the demo scope for the ova. Um, your males and females, which are slides 15, 16, and 17, they should be good, okay? So um, do make sure to take a look at the adult worms. I would never ask you to distinguish between a male and a female, but make sure that you can identify them. And then what we'll do is we'll try to set up a couple of demo scopes that have the uh, neurocidium and the cercaria. Because again, a lot of the slides aren't that great. So we'll try to get a couple more demo slides set up. But the myricidium and cercaria, they would be demo slides or, or demo questions. Okay. All right, folks, so I know that was so much 
once more, so much information. Yeah. Um, I was just curious, like,